Dear Fly students and followers, welcome to our series called The Toughest Five. Our mission is to help you succeed by showcasing how to solve the most challenging HBL questions. In each episode, Fabian and I will go over the five most difficult and frequently commented on questions from each subject in the HBLQ database. We understand how tough these exams can be and we want to support you in overcoming these challenges by breaking down each question using sketches, easy tools and highlighting nasty traps and incorrect answers to show you how well you can prepare for your theoretical ATPL exam and boost your confidence in doing so. We will use ATPLQ, which is best known among flight students as it is designed to be the perfect addition to studying the theory. With one of the largest up-to-date question databases, detailed explanations and a thriving comment section for each question, ATBLQ is the tool to prepare you for your upcoming theory exam. So do yourself a favor, reduce your anxiety, get access using the link below, then study with us, pass your exam and take the next step towards becoming a pilot. The following questions will be from the EASA ATPL database subject flight planning. So pay attention, we'll give you three seconds to pause the question on the screen to test your knowledge and your solving strategy before we start with the explanation. Fabian and I are here to make yeah buddy moments with you. You'll see in a minute. So grab pen and paper and let's get started. Alrighty, let's get started into one of my favorite subjects, flight planning. Let's get straight to the point. We have the given data. The first thing we need is the track from Remol to Glasgow. Looking into the chart, we see it's 191 degrees. Now, given that, this is an IFR chart. That is a magnetic track. So this is important since the track and the wind must be in the same domain for this to work. Now the wind is given at 338 degrees with 45 knots. Now to rule out a few of the possible answers, let's look at the wind. The wind is blowing from the northwest to the southeast and we are flying in a southerly direction. Meaning you have to correct into the wind as it is coming from the right. So you just use the 50-50 joker and have two answers remaining. The easiest way to determine the wind correction angle is with the analog flight computer. I will now show you how it's done. Okay, so if you have a version of a mechanical flight computer that has a wind pointer, it's quite easy. First you start up top with the index and you are going to place your true course underneath it. In our case, this is 1901 degrees. Next up, you take the wind pointer and turn it until it points into the direction the wind is coming from. In our case, this is 338 degrees. Make sure you're using the right side of the speed card that matches the correct color of the wind pointer. Only thing left to do is take our 45 knots of wind and shift the speed card until it aligns with the line that depicts the true airspeed of 200 knots. And there you have it, the wind correction angle is 7 degrees to the right. If your mechanical flight computer does not feature a wind pointer, don't worry, we've got you covered. You start with the index again, but this time you're going to dial in the wind direction first. So in our case, that's 338 degrees. Next up, what you want to do is, you want to place the center circle, so this metal ring, onto a line that depicts the whole tenth of a speed. By doing so, it will be much easier to draw a dot corresponding to your wind speed. In our case, the wind speed is 45 knots, so we count 10, 20, 30, 40, 45 and draw a dot there. Turn the moving dial again until your course matches up with the index. In our case, that's 1901 degrees. All you need to do now is take the dot you drew and shift the speed card until it aligns with the true airspeed of 200 knots and you will see your wind correction angle is 7 degrees to the right. And there we have it. The correct answer is 7 degrees to the right. Now meaning in order to fly the magnetic track on the airway of 191 degrees, you have to fly a magnetic heading of 198 degrees. So the key takeaway from this question 
Don't get misled by the given magnetic heading, you don't need it in this calculation. And secondly, you need to know all the tracks on an IFR chart are magnetic. Those are the two traps in this question. Nothing more to add then. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Let's do it. Good. <laughs>
So let's see if it's right. Yeah, but it is. Half after that. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> Oof. Alrighty, get your calculator out. This one is all about basic addition and subtraction. So what do we start with first? Correct, the dry operating mass. Then we add the traffic load, which gives us the zero fuel mass for this flight. Now add the planned takeoff fuel onto the zero fuel mass. This gives us then the current takeoff mass. Now you see that we have quite a bit of margin until reaching the maximum takeoff mass. If we go back into the question, it clearly states calculate the maximum possible extra fuel. So if we fill up the margin to the maximum takeoff mass, we get 99,490 pounds of extra fuel. Now don't get too excited because you believe you have the correct answer. You have to make sure that you aren't over your maximum landing mass with that amount of extra fuel. Therefore, we need to calculate how high the fuel penalty is if we would take all the extra fuel. Looking at the question again, it states you burn 470 pounds per 1000 pounds of additional mass added. So 99,490 divided by 1000 times 470 equals 46,760 pounds, plus our trip fuel results in 245,380 pounds. And subtract that from our maximum takeoff mass, which gives us the new landing weight of 629,620 pounds, which is lower than the stated maximum landing mass. Meaning we are takeoff mass limited on this flight, and 99,490 pounds is the correct answer. But please double check with your maximum landing weight before logging in your answer. Happy? Happy. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. <clears throat> If you enjoy our explanations so far, we encourage you to check out the ATPLQ website with the link below the video. We want to mention that ATPLQ is far more affordable than many competitors. Okay, so for this question, we recommend that you draw yourself a little sketch that should look like this. This will make it easier for you to visualize what the question is asking of you. Now, similar to the other reduced contingency fuel question we previously answered, there are two routes that we have to calculate the required fuel for. The first is from the departure airport to the destination via the decision point, and the second route is from the departure airport to the decision point, and then onwards to the optional refueling destination. Now, let's start with the trip fuel for route one. Therefore, we sum up the given trip fuels for both legs of this route, resulting in 10,475 kilograms. Next, we add the contingency fuel, which in case of route 1, is 5% of the fuel required from the decision point to the destination only. 5% of 2,120 leaves us with 106 kilograms. We add this to the total trip fuel plus the given taxi fuel of 230 kilograms and final reserve fuel of 1200 kilograms and end up with 12,011 kilograms of required block fuel. Note that the question states that no destination alternate requirements apply, so there's no added alternate fuel here. Thanks Fabian, since we need to compare the two total fuel figures for both routes, I will now show you how to calculate the second route option. As we did in the previous reduced contingency fuel calculation, we again need to consider the fuel used from the departure airport to the decision point plus fuel from the decision point to destination 2. Now the difference between Fabian's calculation and mine is that we need to add 3% contingency on the overall fuel, not just from decision point to destination 2. So the total will be 10,521.45 kilograms plus the final reserve fuel of 1,200 kilos. Now another trap here, the question states the minimum required fuel, meaning block fuel, so you have to add the taxi fuel of 230 kilos as well. 
now giving us a minimum required fuel of 11,951.45 kilograms. And if we now apply the reduced contingency fuel policy, we have to choose the greater of the two possible fuel scenarios. So Fabian's calculation is the greater one. So his 12,011 kilograms is the correct answer. Now to sum up, the trap in this question is that for the calculation that Joe just did, you need to calculate with 3% and not with 5% contingency. And the reason is because in this question, you were given an en route alternate aerodrome on your way to destination 2. If you would have calculated it with 5%, answer B then seems correct, but it's not. Be careful there. We hope that with this little sketch, it was easier to visualize. Again, just another donkey bridge. Ready for the next question? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah buddy. buddy. Good. Okay, this one is no joy because you need to know which fuel figures apply to your calculation. So let's start from the beginning and we'll add the fuel step by step. Starting with taxi, okay, 10 liters into the tank. Then we need to depart from our departure aerodrome, so 40 liters into the tank. And here is already the first trap, which was a bit of a head scratcher for Fabian and I. In the regulations, it states that the cruise portion of flight starts at the end of the departure routing, meaning you don't need the 40 liters of climb fuel. This is where everyone is getting it wrong. Then we add the cruise fuel, which is an easy calculation. 95 liters per hour times 2.4 equals 228 liters into the tank. Then we fly an approach and a potential landing with 20 liters. Now another one that gets missed out is the contingency fuel. So you need to add 5% of contingency onto the trip fuel. So our trip fuel is departure, cruise and approach, resulting in 14.4 liters. Now let's say we are on approach and the weather was below minima and you have to return to the alternate airport, which as stated in the question is the departure airport. So from the moment you are over the runway, you can yet again add departure and go around fuel, which gets us up to the cruising level. So another 40 liters into the tank plus 228 liters of the cruise fuel and another 20 liters for the approach and landing. Please understand you are now flying to your alternate, so no more contingency added. Now regulation-wise, you also have to have a final reserve fuel. The trick here is the question gives you the fuel figures for holding, but what is the regulatory minimum for a multi-engine piston aeroplane? 30 minutes or 45 minutes? Correct, it's 45 minutes at holding speed. So 76 liters per hour times 0.75, which is three quarters, gives you 57 liters. So to sum it all up, we end up with 657 liters. And do we have that as an answer possibility? Yes, sir, that'll be answer A. And that's a good, yeah, buddy. <laughs> we hope our problem solving methods were clear and our sketches and explanations were helpful. If you want us to tackle more of these challenging questions, use the link below to get your ATPLQ subscription and start practicing right away. Notify ATPLQ via email which question you'd like us to do a video on and they will forward your request to us. The team of ATPLQ is always there to help and answer your questions and the question you struggle the most with might be the next one we're going to be answering in a video. And on that bombshell, here is your checklist for today. Subscribe to my channel, check, activate the notification bell, check, follow my Instagram account, check, and click the link below to start learning with ATPLQ today, check. And don't forget, a good pilot is always learning and the best candidates come well prepared. Wishing you all the best, Fabian and Captain Joe. <laughs>